My name is Sara. Um, I was born and raised in Nicaragua. If you don't know where Nicaragua is, because a lot of people don't know where it is, it's Central America, right below Costa Rica and above Honduras and El Salvador. A lot of people confuse it with Nigeria for some reason, but it's Nicaragua. <laughs> I had a pretty normal childhood growing up, I would say. Um, I grew up with my dad, with my mom, my two older brothers and me. I'm the youngest in my family. I went to a private French school. So I had a lot of international friends while growing up, like all over the world, especially from Europe, but a lot of people from France, Belgium, Spain, Italy, also from Africa, America, like all over the place. I really had everything I wanted while growing up. It was kind of like Ariana Grande, like I wanted, I got it. I was a little spoiled child because I was like the only girl in the family and the youngest. So my dad really spoiled me. But later on in my life, uh, my dad started making a lot of poor financial decisions. So we started struggling with money and we lost the house we were living in. We had to move into my grandmother's house um, and we were able to stay in my school, in my private school, because my mom, which at the time my mom had been a stay at home mom. Because she made the mistake that a lot of women do uh, when they're like youngish and their men or boyfriend, whatever. He's like, oh, don't worry, I'll pay for you. Don't worry about working. I got you, babe. She made that mistake and she believed my dad when he said that. So even though my mom has two degrees, she's a lawyer, even though she has her you know, education, she never really did anything with it. So by that time in my life where we started struggling with money, my mom went up, opened up her own business. She started selling food. She actually started selling smoothies and milkshakes at my house. But once that went well, she started selling food and then she opened up her own local uh, restaurant. So she was selling at my house and she had her local going on. Oh, that's so nice. I love yeah. that. So because of that, we were able to stay at my school uh, because it was like a private school. So it was kind of like sp expensive. But uh, really, my story begins in 2018. Uh, 2018 is really the year that marked my life and marked the life of a lot of Nicaraguans where I'm from. Um, so everything started in April 2018. There was some new reforms that the government had implemented. These reforms affected the elders in my country. It was decreasing their monthly salary by 5% to be able to afford their care, so like their medical expenses. Um, also, it was raising the taxes for the employers and employees that they had to pay. So everybody was protesting because they were like, you know, the reason why the National Security Institute, which is the institute that take care takes care of the elders, the reason why this institute has no money is because the government is using the money to fund their personal expenses, to fund their houses, their parties, their trips, their, you know, luxuries. So people started protesting. People were mad about that about that change that they implemented. And the, also at this time, there was some fires going on in one of the most important biological reserves in Nicaragua, and the government didn't do enough to interfere in the matter. So it, it was like four days after the fire had started, they put an alert. So there was already acres, thousands of acres that, of land that had been burning by this time. So people were mad about that too. So people started protesting. And unfortunately, the government didn't like this. Uh, this is the time where Nicaragua entered a socio-political and humanitarian crisis in a matter of days because the government's actions towards the protesters, because it was a shock to everyone that their answer to our protest was with violence. So police and army went out on the streets to stop the people protesting. And so everybody's like, why? Why? Like, we're just peacefully manifesting. Why would you have to recur to violence? So at this time, even after the reform was removed, because the government ended up re removing the reform that they had implemented, even after that, people started demanding to, to get the president out of power, to get the government out of power. Because really, Nicaragua has been in a dictatorship since 2007, since he, the president, has been in the power. There has been no free elections because every time there's an election, he wins and nobody votes for him. <laughs> and also, Nicaragua has declined in all aspects because since he's been in power, declining politically, economically, socially, in all aspects. So we just didn't want him in power anymore. And since the beginning, the fight between 
protesters and the people that supported the government had always been unfair because us as the people we used homemade guns like homemade molotov or you know stones and they used tear gas and armed guns during the beginning of the protests a lot of people died unfortunately because mainly because of lost bullets because i'm oh, sorry mainly from lost bullets but also just people you know straight shooting at other people like purposely people were shooting at each other you know it wasn't a mistake or anything um one of these people, uh, his name is Alvaro Conrado. He was only 15 years old and he got shot in the middle of his throat. And the video went viral because it's a video of him where he's like in the floor crying because he's like, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. I need help. And everybody's freaking out because all he was doing was giving out waters to the people that were walking, protesting. And so everybody's like freaking out. I don't know, you know, how we help you. And they called the ambulance and he unfortunately passed away. He was only 15 years old. Mm, it's horrible. Yeah. People also started putting up what we call tranques, which is like barriers of stones. So the police trucks wouldn't pass. And so people could hide behind the, the stones, like the barriers of stones, if they were shooting. So everybody was immobilized because cars couldn't pass by. So schools were shut down. Businesses were shut down. Everybody was in their houses because it was really dangerous outside. Uh, we also... <laughs> we also... A lot of people started burning buildings uh, as a way of protest. Major ships were used, burned down. A lot of like offices of majors were burned down, but also people that supported the government started burning media centers that were showing the truth. Like, um, I remember this one was by my house and we woke up in the morning. It was all like burned down to the ground. It was a media center called Ruben Darío and overnight they did it so nobody could do anything about it and they ended up actually killing the person who was in charge of that media center that was showing what was happening during the protests mm -hmm. and this was the first time that you had ever experienced something like this over of there of course okay. yeah i was only 14 at the time okay so yeah it was really shocking for everyone mm -hmm. what was going on because like i said it went from like nothing to everything okay. in the matter of a week but yeah, the government didn't want the truth out. The government didn't want to look bad. They also they never were, do, <laughs> right? <laughs> they they were blaming the killings to us. Like they were like, oh, the people protesting, they are disturbing the, the peace. They are the ones causing all these deaths. They never took accountability for what they were doing. There was a lot of people wrongfully incarcerated because of this, um, and although the people never had actual guns. Like, they blamed us for their killings, although we never had actual guns. So it's like, make it make sense. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so young people, the students, became the face of the revolution. They became the strength of our country. So also as a way of protesting, they started confining within the universities as a way of, like, we're here and we're not going to leave. So that's kind of when where I come into the story. My mom started dropping up a lot of, like, supplies for the students that were confining she would you know bring canned food and water, water bottles for the students that were there because they were there for days weeks without being able to leave because the police were surrounding them so they couldn't really leave once they were in there and I remember I would beg my mom to let me go to the protests with her <laughs> and I understood that going out meant danger I understood that it meant you know, maybe getting killed or going to prison. But still, my mom, as a lawyer and as a woman of faith, she always taught me to fight for what is not right. She always taught me to have that heart of, you know, caring for others and to seek for justice. So we were always pre present when there was protests. Like We tried to be there. And we would just grab our flags and our water bottle and go out with our signs, you know, government, we want you out. We want answers for all the people that have been dying and you don't do anything about it. We want change, but we are not getting any. Um, having a flag actually became a sign of the revolution and it became a sign of like terrorism for the government. Weirdly enough, having the sign of your own country was like a sign of getting stopped by the police and being asked why are you you know wearing that 
flag. Where are you going with that flag? Like you couldn't wear the little flag of Nicaragua in your car because you would get pulled over and probably go to jail. And one of those examples is actually Miss Universe. Um, this year, the winner of Miss Universe is from Nicaragua. She won Chinese Palacios. And when she won, you know, patriotism, everybody went out on the streets and we were, you know, waving our flags and we were so hyped because nothing like this has happened in our country. And the government didn't like this and they actually banned her from coming back to Nicaragua. They fired the person who was in charge of the Miss Universe in Nicaragua and they had to exile out of the country. That is insane. Yeah. Another form of protest was also people starting cutting off what we call the tree of lives, which are um, tree shaped metal structures that were placed by the government in 2013. They're about 50 feet tall. But these structures for us are considered symbols of are considered symbols of dictatorship because they light up. And in order to keep these trees functioning, taxes were raised people's taxes were raised so we had to pay out of our own pocket you know keeping the streets up so and nobody liked them because they were ugly nobody liked them and it's like why can't you just not put natural trees like why do you have to put metal trees outside so we started cutting them off as a way of protest and I, I was actually there one time when we threw one down and I, it was so exciting it was so hyped when the streets were going down because everybody would run and get on top of them and start jumping on them. And we were like, yeah, because it just meant kind of like we're here and we're fighting and maybe we can get somewhere, you know? Right, yeah. In another instance, while we were on one of these walks or marches protesting, there was thousands and thousands of people. I think there was like 30,000 people walking. And... We're in the middle of the protest. Like my mom and I were walking with our signs, yelling. And all of a sudden, I see people running backwards, running to towards us. And my mom and I would look at each other and I'm like, what's going on? And then we just started running, right? Because everybody else is running. And then we hear gunshots. And we're like, okay, the police pulled up. And so we went to like a bank that was nearby. And we were like trying to hide in the bank. And then I see... The police truck pulled up like right at the bank and all I see is he tore the tear gas all over on me. My throat is burning. I cannot breathe. I'm like about to pass out and I'm worrying because I know my mom has asthma. asthma. So I know if I'm struggling, my mom's struggling even worse. So my eyes are watering. My eyes are red. I cannot see anything. I'm trying to look for my mom. I find her and then I, someone is passing waters. She's like, give it to children. So... They, I get water to like run down my face and then I hear gunshots again and I'm like, I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> like I was so scared and I just remember grabbing my mom and then my dad came out of nowhere. I don't know where my dad came from, but he helped us jump over the fence that was keeping us from, you know, the police and us. He helped us, helped us jump over the fence and we just started running and we just could hear the people screaming behind us, the gunshots, the gas. It was it was chaotic. It was crazy. And and was that the police just trying to, like, stop the protesting? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Just trying to keep us, keep us quiet. Keep us... That isn't... Like, I can't believe that that's what they... I mean, I guess, like... I feel like the police kind of go to, like, the worst possible option sometimes <laughs> of, like, let's just, like, stop it by... Like you said, like, it's more of, like, that... The violent. Mm -hmm. The violence mm -hmm. of it instead of just, mm -hmm. like you know, trying to neutralize it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. So that that was, it was, that's why it was so confusing to us. So it's like, I mean, I get it if you don't want us out in the streets, but why do you have to recur to violence? Why do you have to kill us right. to just stop us? I don't, you know, we, we were asking for dialogue and for a conversation to change things, maybe. That's it. That's what we wanted. Mm -hmm. Not this. Right. <laughs> um. There's also another really sad story that I wanted to mention here, which uh, it's the story of the family Velasquez Pavon. They were in the neighborhood called Carlos, Mar Carlos Marx. This family unfortunately died by in the hands of the government because they had a three-store house, right? The paramilitaries were the snipers, actually, who were shooting at people, they had asked them if they could use the third floor of their house 
to get a better angle and get a better view of the students and maybe shoot them that way. Obviously, they said no. They're like, we don't want you here. That night, the police came to their house, started shooting at them and burned out their their house because they, you know, they say no to them using their third floor. And two children died and four adults died in that house. The children were only four he was only three months of age and the other children i think he was four or three years old and there was one survivor out of this tragedy she jumped off the the, one of the floors of the house she survived and she claims she's like the government did this i was there when they were shooting at my family when they were trying to jump off with me and they were like if you jump we're gonna shoot you anyways so i was there and the neighbors are also witnesses because the neighbors say we were trying to help them and they were shooting at us all with, at, as well. They were, you know, pointing their guns at us as well and telling us, you know, if you get out, we're going to shoot you anyways. So it was really devastating. I remember that morning when I saw that in the news. I had woken up, I was checking my Facebook and I saw the story and my mom and I, we started crying because it was just like, wow, like how can you be so heartless? Yeah. Right? How can you hate on your people so much? There's another uh, protest. We actually refer to it as the massacre of Mo- on Mother's Day, because in Nicaragua we celebrate Mother's Day on the 30th of May of March. We celebrate the 30th of March, and on that day we went out on the streets, and it was kind of like a way to had their moms commemorate the children that had died to this point. And so everybody were black and everybody was down in the streets. We were not even holding our flags. We were just, you know, protesting to get justice for the people that had died at this point. It wasn't even to get the government out anymore. It was just kind of like we want justice now. And the grief and the pain of the people wasn't enough for the for the snipers and the paramilitaries and the police and the army to get to us and start shooting again 18 people died that day and more than 200 people were injured that day so yeah my people my people and i were fragile at this point uh it was really unfair fight we like i said we asked for a conversation for a change and they answered with guns and unforgettable acts that they will always will be remembering our history. Things got really bad to the point that by July 2018, um, because everything was shut down, schools were shut down, businesses were shut down. And remember, I told you my mom, my mom had a business in our house. You know, the main clients were university students mm-hmm. because there was a college nearby our house. Um, not there to was, interrupt you, sorry, but yeah. so was every day at this point, was it just like protesting since everything was shut down? Mainly, okay. mainly uh, the students, mainly that were within the universities mm-hmm. and also the people that were hiding behind the, the the stone barriers, they were just kept there and, you know, it was like open fire. Okay. The police would shoot on one side and they would wait, throw the stones and then wait again in hopes that to stop them from fighting, you know, okay. for, in hopes of stopping them from But this shooting. whole time, everything was just closed yes, down. Okay. everything, yeah, everything was down. Um, so by July 2018, um, my mom took the decision to leave the country because, like I said, I mean, you can just hear it was really bad out there. There was no schools, there was no money for us anymore because my dad's businesses was down and my mom's businesses were also shut down. So, and my mom also feared for the security, for the security of my brothers because they were 16 and about 20 at this time. And the main target for police was young people, you know? So my mom feared for them. And she took the decision to exile out of the country. Um, we decided to move to the neighbor country, which is Costa Rica. And it was meant to be for a couple of months. It was meant to be until things got better, until, you know, this got a resolution. So we moved out of Nicaragua. And obviously we were, <laughs> I remember on the bus ride to Costa Rica, we were all crying. <laughs> because it was just so much. It was the fact that we had to leave for this government that don't care about us and it's just so unfair we felt so betrayed by our own people 
and we were hurting for other families as well that had lost family members. It was it was horrible. <laughs> we got to Costa Rica. We stayed at my aunt's house uh, for a couple months, and then after, I, I remember my mom and I would we would sleep in a little small bed, and my brothers would sleep in an inflated mattress, and the mattress had holes on it. So in the morning they woke up in the floor because all the air mm. was out, <laughs> and. After a couple of months that we had hopes that the situation in Nicaragua would get better and nothing got better if in case it got worse, we were like, okay, well, I guess we start, we need to start settling down. My mom started looking for a job. Um, we started looking for schools. So then we were started getting integrated to society. We found our own place. I remember all our furniture was like, gifts from our family members or just stuff that we found on the side of the streets <laughs> but yeah my mom actually she had a really hard time finding a job because obviously we didn't have any papers to legally work or work permit so she started selling pastries like homemade pastries that she would wake up like 3 a.m make the little cakes that she would sell and she would leave around 5 a.m she would stop like she would be like a bus stop and selling them but by 7 a.m. she had to leave because she ran the chances of the police getting to her and you know telling her to you know she can't be selling because she doesn't have a work permit or worst case scenario she gets deported so in school as well like I wasn't doing very well not like like educational wise but like socially wise I was really struggling to make friends uh, <laughs> I had to walk to school. Like my brother and I, we had to walk f to school because we didn't have enough money to cover bus the the bus the, the the school bus, which wasn't for free. Like it's here in America, mm -hmm. we had to pay for it, and the school was an hour away from my house. So we had to walk every single day the way there and the way back, and we also only had like one shirt and one pair of pants for our uniforms because we wore uniforms. So we had to wash them every day because we were sweaty from the walking, walking yeah. yeah and our dryer didn't even work so we have to air dry it but costa rica's climate is humid and cold so it would never actually dry up so we have to work our, wear our cold uniforms walk to school that way it was it was really bad oh um, my gosh yeah actually my shoes were you know plenty of holes because of all the walking and they were like cheap shoes and I remember I got really close to my English teacher at the time because I always loved English and I always was like I always felt connected to the American culture I was always like listening to Rihanna and you know pop culture just I was really into it so I was always you know trying to learn English and I got really close to her because I was like one of the only students that actually did something in her class. So she liked me. And I remember she looked at my shoes and she was like, why are your shoes that way? And I told her like, well, I just don't want to ask my mom for new shoes because she just has so much going on. And she was like, okay, don't worry about it. And she was like, come on, get into my car. We got into her car and she took me to pay less and Aww. she got me a pair of shoes. Yeah, that's sweet. That was sweet of her. And Eventually, my my brother, he started selling like chocolates and nuts at school. So we were able to afford our bus tickets. And I started doing my friend's homework for money as well. <laughs> oh my <God. laughs> yeah. Hey, gotta do what you gotta do. <laughs> yeah, that's my little side hustle. But we just barely had any money to afford living expenses. We had to ration our food as well. So at this point, I was really depressed. Um, I was really depressed. It was just so many changes in the last few months of my life. I mean, like I said, I went from having everything to having nothing. And on top of this, like I didn't mention, but my dad didn't come with us. My dad stayed in Nicaragua and when we left Nicaragua, my dad was completely out of the picture. It's kind of like he forgot he had children. Mm -hmm. He never provided us. He never helped us with money. So it was just my mom and us. So I went from having everything, from having a loving family, to having nothing, to having a dad that doesn't care about me, to having no friends, to having no social life. And I'm sure all of my family felt the same, but it was just in, it wasn't something that we talked about because, right? But... I'm sure everybody in my family was having a hard time. Yeah. And so moving forward, uh, my mom had an active visa. 
at this time. So she took the decision to come to the United States for only three months so she could get some money and she would come back to us. Because three months is like the maximum time, the maximum time you can stay as a tourist. So she would just work for the three months and then come back to, like I said, come back to us. So she left and it was just my brothers and I. And we were still going to school. We were still doing our thing. And she was working in, you know, the United States. Who were you guys living with? It was just us. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it was just us. Was that hard for you, not having yeah, her there? That yeah. Was, that was, I was going to say, um, that was really horrible for me. A horrible time for me. Because at this point, I mean, I had confided in my mom. I was like, you know, things are bad, but at least I have my mommy, you know? Yeah. And I was like, things are bad, and I don't have my mom. <laughs> So, yeah, definitely it was hard. And, I mean, my brothers, like, they were, like, in their 20s. And I think my brother was 16 or 17 at the time. So, they're in their own thing. They're doing their own thing. They don't care about me. Mm -hmm. So, I was, like, alone in my room. And then COVID hit. Right. <laughs> so, I was even more alone in my room. Just crying all day. Missing my mom. Missing my life. Missing my dad. Missing everything Did you have I any had. contact with your mom at this point? Like, were you guys able to stay in touch? Yeah, yeah. We would text and so, but she, her work didn't allow her to, you know, be in her phone. Mm -hmm. So we had barely any contact. And when she would get home, I understand she's tired. So yeah. she's going to bed. So obviously it was kind of like we would get a phone call from us, from her and be like, hey, how are you guys doing? Okay. Just like checking in. Yeah. Like, yeah. And then, you know, goodbye yeah so my mom eventually she overstayed her three months she stayed in the united states because she started her process as a political refugee here so in order to get her work permit and to get her social security and all that so she started working she actually had a, a good job that was you know bringing her some money so we were doing better economically but like mentally we were doing really bad so my mom noticed that and she was like you know what you're coming with me i'm gonna bring you here to the united states and i was i actually had a activist as well so i was able to fly to here and stay here and at this time also my mom fell in love she met my stepdad and now he's like He's like my dad. Like oh, I really love him. He's one of the persons that I love the most. And he helped my mom my mom bring me to the United States. So when I came here, I mean I didn't want to come here. <laughs> I do not I was terrified of coming here. Because it was kind of like that realization of shit, I gotta do this again, you know? I gotta start school again. I gotta make friends again. I gotta get used to this new family because my stepdad had, you know, children of his own. So it's kinda like I gotta get used to this family that I don't know, this language that I'm not familiar with because Spanish is my first language. So it was just kind of like, I do not want to come. But my mom was like, well, you don't have no choice. You're coming with mm -hmm. me. So when I came here, uh, you know, my stepdad, he gave me a bed. He gave me food. Like, that's why I'm really grateful for him because he gave me a good start. And then I signed up for school. I started school here in the middle of my sophomore year. And as well, it was really hard. <laughs> it wasn't hard only because I was new to the country, but it was hard for me because of the language barrier. I wasn't really good in English. So I remember actually I would use the, the voice note in my phone and I would record like my teachers in their classes and I would like transcribe everything when I came home. That way, that's kind of how I got, you know, up to the date on my classes but in class I would be so quiet and I was like I have no idea what these people are yeah. saying <laughs> that's good though that you were doing that that's, yeah you know, yeah like putting in the effort thank you I started getting heavy into Duolingo I literally thank thankful to Duolingo because they really helped me a lot with the English mm -hmm. and did your brothers come over here too they stayed no, they stayed okay. yeah they stayed um but yeah, so I started slowly improving my English, slowly making friends, slowly getting used to this new life. And then in my junior year, I was feeling more confident. I eventually, I got a job at a restaurant. I got my license. I got a car. I was doing well in school. I joined the weightlifting team. And I even gave myself the chance of start dating. 
but I was still getting used to this new life you know it, and I was trying to feel like I belong here and I started dating this guy I was really in love with him <laughs> I mean he always told me how proud he was of my culture and my background and I really believed him he had issues with substance abuse like he drank a lot more than he, his body could handle and I remember after nine or eight months eight nine or eight months of us dating I had him come over to my house at night like my parents didn't know he was coming over and he was drunk and he started yelling this like so many things at me like oh you don't love me you hate me you're fake and I'm like like what is going on with you like you're you know you're my boyfriend like why are you acting this way and then he was yelling so much to the fact that I was like you know you need to keep your voice shut because my mom doesn't know you're here and my mom finds you here I'm gonna get in trouble you're gonna get in trouble then he was like you know what I don't care he left the house but it was like 3 a.m in the morning and he was like I'm gonna walk home his house is like an hour away from my house and I know his broke ass doesn't have money for an uber <laughs> and he doesn't have, he doesn't <laughs> Oh my god he doesn't have a car either uh -huh. so i'm like you know what i'm gonna offer him to take to to give him a ride to his house but before that i'm gonna have to call him down because he's like saying all these things and then i brought him to my house in order to like try to keep him calm down but then unfortunately he started getting physically abusive to me like he started choking me and saying like i know people like you i know people like you just want to hurt other people and i'm like what are you talking about but at the same time like i'm like getting choked i'm like you know running out of air and i'm like freaking out because this is like this man is telling me like i know people like you and i'm not gonna let you hurt anybody so i'm thinking oh this is it for me i was like he's gonna kill me but then he like i was like let me go let me go he let me go and then i was like i need to take you to your house like you need to get out of here so the way I like persuade him into getting into my car because he didn't want to get into my car. I was like, baby, it's okay. Baby, I'll, it's going to be fine. You know, my love, I'll take care of you. Body did that. And he believed it. So I took him in my car. And honestly, the worst part of everything was the ride to his house because he started calling me names. Like he started calling me all sorts of names that are not worth mentioning. And he said this thing that really stuck with me and really affected me in my process of figuring out my personality my identity as an immigrant he said how is it possible that you that how is it possible that my mother who was raised and born in this country has less opportunities than you as a fucking immigrant and so when I heard those words, like my heart shattered because it's like, this is the man that I left into my, that I let into my life that knows my family, knows my culture, knows how of a soft spot this, you know, this is to me. You, he knows that I'm still struggling to get adapted to this country. And he comes to say these things like it was just, it was really hard on me. Yeah. So after that, I was like, well, you know, I need to start working on myself. I need to start working on my self-esteem because it really affected me. And I realized if the worst of a man can affect me so bad, it's because I'm letting them have control over me and control over my life. So I was like, I need to start working on myself. And Take I your did. power back. Right. So mm -hmm. I was like, I need to start working on myself. You know, I, I started doing even more better at school. Then I graduated with honors. I had amazing friends. And I just kind of had my life get together slowly but surely. And then, like I said, I graduated. I am now in college. Um, I'm a pharmacy technician. I got my job going on. My brothers eventually, they actually came to the United States. Okay. Uh, they came here about a year ago. So now they're here with us. And I was going to ask, do you have any contact with your dad or no? I do have contact with my dad. He sometimes calls me, but he is the type of dad that he's like, the phone works both ways, right. you know? So it's kind of like... But I he's barely, still over there. Yeah, he's okay. still in Nicaragua. Yeah. And also another reason why we weren't able to go back to Nicaragua once we were in Costa Rica, it's because he also lost the house that my grandmother had gave us. So mm -hmm. we have we had anywhere to come back so yeah. we decided to just stay in Costa Rica do you guys yeah. have any plans on going back over to visit 
Yes. Okay. But because we are in the process as political refugees, we're not really allowed to. Mm-hmm. But hopefully, now that my married, she, my mom married a citizen, I hope that can change something yeah. and you know give us a chance to go back to Nicaragua. Because do you have other family over there? I do, but it's my grandmother okay. mainly and my friends. You yeah. know. But. The, Nicar- the situation in Nicaragua never really got a resolution. So that is all that still going on? The protests have stopped. Okay. The protests are stopped now, but I'm saying he's still in power. Mm-hmm. There's still no justice for those families that suffer loss of any kind. Right. And our vo- it's just kind of, it feels really sh- heart shattering because we, it's kind of like all that effort and for what, you know? Like, our voices weren't heard and it just kind of feels like we gave all this sacrifice for nothing according to the inter-american commission of human rights there were at least 355 people that lost their lives during these times more than a hundred thousand people that had to emigrate out of nicaragua and according to the organization of american states more than two thousand people got injured during this time but I know and I know that all Nicaraguans we will never forget, you know, and we still are fighting. Even if even if I'm not there, I'm still claiming for a free Nicaragua. I want freedom in my country. I want justice for all those people that never got justice. And I hope one day we can get answers and I hope one day we get a free Nicaragua. Yeah, and I think too it's important to you to, be able to one day go back and forth and visit and, you know, go to where you're from and be proud of that and not feel like you're scared or like, you know, there's anything, um, anything that involves danger for yourself or your family or anything of the sort. Yeah, definitely. But I wish my story uh, also serves as a way to demonstrate that because there's a lot of stigma, a lot of immigrants, and I just hope someone listens to this and realize that a lot of us we never wanted to leave our country you know it's not like we had a cho- it wasn't a choice for us it was kind of like a forced choice that we i mean a forced decision that we had to take leave our country like i mean i still i wish i could go back there and be with my family and be with my friends but i didn't have that choice because it was our safety or that you know right. and it's just that's no way to live right like you see like everyone deserves opportunity yeah. and education and exactly you know a career all of exactly. that stuff exactly and it's just kind of like i i know other people might be like oh but why would you put in yourself in danger why were you going out on the streets but it's just kind of like when you when you see injustice happen in front of your eyes I mean, at least for me, it's really hard for me to stay still. Right. And just let that happen. And I think it's everyone's choice if you want to stand up for what you believe or right. not. Right. And if you don't want to, then don't. But for those that choose to, like, let them. Right. Exactly. exactly. And you weren't being violent, so <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> exactly. And even at a young age, because, I mean, I was 14 when I was, you know, going to the protests and everything. Even at a young age, I could understand these. And... I never wish things happened, though. You know, I never wished for things to happen the way the way they happened. Mm-hmm. I, I like I said, I never wished I had to leave my country. I never. Right. I know some people might be like, "Oh, you know, why are they come into our country or taking our jobs and everything?" But it's kind of like, have you ever put yourself in their positions or wonder why actually right. they're here? You know, exactly. I don't think a lot of people have that empathy towards each other. Absolutely, you know, and it's really heartbreaking to see so many people would point their fingers at each other judge each other for no reason Mm -hmm. you know and I think it's important to you know you coming on here and sharing not only your story but your personal experience and the feelings that you had because there is a lot of young individual there's a lot of young individuals that you know have come over here and most likely if not definitely feel the same way that you have and felt like you know it's hard to find yourself and figure out who you are and starting over that many times at such a young age is so confusing (laughs) and not easy and then on top of it like on top of just starting over because even starting over state to state is hard so like Mm -hmm. starting over in a different country not knowing the language that well Mm -hmm. not having friends you know it's a lot 
of pressure and I think it can be ex- I mean it is extremely scary mm-hmm. and I feel like it makes you it puts you in this vulner- vulnerable position because you want to learn and open yourself up mm-hmm. to everything but you don't even know your surroundings or what's right. going on exactly which is so challenging really and I, I feel is, yeah. like you serve as this pillar of hope for so many people that are going to come over or have come over and are still kind of feeling these ways because I think that takes a lot of years and just kind of um real life experience yeah. to kind of like you said gain your confidence and find that and and on your own yeah that can be really difficult because that's a time that you want to lean on people and like right. even like you said with being in a relationship that is something that helps you learn too so mm-hmm. it's like of course you opened yourself up to that and I think that that can be great and unfortunately it was with a piece of shit but <laughs> but you know and I, I just think that it really you serve as a pillar of hope to people that are still finding their way yeah. and kind of navigating yeah. through their lives and finding yeah. who they are and it gives them courage and you're still so young and it's all <laughs> still so fresh so you have so much more opportunities ahead of you as well you. which is important oh, it's those sweet words thank you oh so you're much. welcome it's true <laughs> but yeah I mean I, I wish like you said I wish someone out there listening that might be going through my same experience or any similarities that they might find with my story I just want to say like you are definitely stronger than what you think you are Uh, that's something I learned throughout my life so many times where it's like I feel like I cannot do it enough I just feel like so overwhelmed with so many feelings there's always that little light in you that's like you know you can keep going you can keep going you can do anything right anything you can set your mind to you can do yes absolutely well thank you so much for having me thank you for listening to my story of course you did amazing and thank you so much for sharing your story and your experience it means so much to me i'm so glad you wanted to do it on this show um but no you did a great job